From New York, this is Democracy Now! Will you commit here today for a peaceful transferal of power after the election? Well, we're going to have to see what happens. You know that I've been complaining very strongly about the ballots, and the ballots are a disaster. The election that could break America as President Trump refuses to commit to the upcoming election, uh, accepting the results if he loses. We'll speak to Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Barton Gelman of The Atlantic about how Trump could throw the election into chaos and subvert the results. We'll also hear a response from Senator Bernie Sanders. This is not just an election between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. This is an election between Donald Trump and democracy. And democracy must win. And we'll speak to one of the most powerful religious leaders in the country, Bishop Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, the first African American to lead the denomination. This election occurs in a time of global pandemic, a time when there is hardship, sickness, suffering and death. But this election also occurs in a time of great divisions, divisions that are deep, dangerous, and potentially injurious to democracy. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. For the second day in a row, President Trump refused to commit to accepting the results of November's election if his rival Joe Biden wins. Trump was asked about the election as he left the White House Thursday to campaign in North Carolina. We want to make sure the election is honest, and I'm not sure that it can be. I don't, I don't know that it can be with this whole situation. Unsolicited ballots. There are unsolicited millions being sent to everybody. President Trump's threat to invalidate the will of the voters sparked widespread alarm among Democrats, progressives and some Republicans. On Thursday, Vermont Independent Senator Bernie Sanders delivered a major address saying the future of American democracy is at stake. We must ensure in this unprecedented moment in American history that this is an election that is free and fair an election in which voters are not intimidated, an election in which all votes are counted, and an election in which the loser accepts the results. We'll hear more of Senator Sanders' major address later in the broadcast. On Capitol Hill, FBI Director Christopher Wray told the Senate Homeland Security Committee Thursday he has seen no evidence of the widespread voter fraud claimed by President Trump among mail-in ballots. Not seen historically uh, any kind of coordinated national voter fraud effort uh, in a major election, uh, whether it's by mail or, or otherwise. The FBI director's testimony came as a U.S. attorney and an FBI field office in Pennsylvania issued an unusual statement claiming they're investigating reports of tampering with nine military ballots. The U.S. attorney says the ballots were improperly opened with votes cast for Donald Trump discarded by elections officials. The Trump campaign then seized on the announcement, saying, quote, Democrats are trying to steal the election. Loyola Law School professor Justin Levitt questioned the timing of the announcement announcement telling NPR, quote, it is the vital duty of government not to announce partial facts and potential issues in pending investigations. Indeed, it's quite improper to announce the fact of an inquiry and grotesquely improper to announce whom the ballots were cast for as if that mattered in the investigation. In Louisville, Kentucky, protesters defied a curfew for the second straight night and marched to demand justice for Breonna Taylor, the 26-year-old African-American EMT who was shot to death inside her own apartment by plainclothes police officers serving a no-knock warrant in March. Overnight, 
Kentucky State Representative Attica Scott live stream her own arrest alongside her daughter and 22 others on charges of first-degree rioting, failure to disperse, and unlawful assembly. A day earlier, Scott filmed as scores of heavily armed riot police flooded the streets of Louisville following a grand jury's announcement that none of the officers who fired 32 bullets into Taylor's home would face homicide charges. People marching down the street were met with literally dozens of police vehicles, officers hopping out, batons, their bats drawn. Brianna Taylor's family is scheduled to speak publicly today for the first time since the grand jury's decision on Wednesday. Kentucky's governor and Louisville's mayor are calling on the attorney general of Kentucky to release the grand jury transcripts. On Capitol Hill, Kentucky Republican Senator Rand Paul lashed out at the Black Lives Matter movement, accusing it of targeting elected officials with what he said was terrorism. Their goal is terrorism. They're admitting it. If you look at their exchanges online and social media, they are saying their goal is to terrorize public officials and really anybody. Protests demanding justice for Breonna Taylor continue in cities across the United States. In Los Angeles, a peaceful march for black lives was attacked by drivers in two separate incidents Thursday evening, leaving at least one person hospitalized. There have been at least 69 car attacks on Black Lives Matter protesters since George Floyd was killed by Minneapolis police officers in late May. In Tucson, Arizona, the family of 27-year-old Carlos Ingram Lopez who was killed in police custody in April, is demanding charges be brought against officers involved in his death after prosecutors said they would not face an indictment. Ingram Lopez died on April 21st after officers pinned him face down to the ground for 12 minutes at his grandmother's house. In police body cam video, he can be heard asking for water and his grandmother. At one point, he says, I can't breathe. Coronavirus cases in the United States are rapidly surging in at least 22 states. The biggest increases have been seen across the Midwest and West, including Texas, Arizona and Minnesota. On Thursday, President Trump rallied an estimated 15,000 of his followers at a massive campaign event in Jacksonville, Florida, with no social distancing and few people wearing masks. In Virginia, public health officials are demanding the cancellation of Trump's plan Friday evening rally at the Newport News Williamsburg International Airport, warning of a severe public health threat if the rally is allowed to proceed. An executive order by Virginia Governor Ralph Northam bans gatherings of more than 250 people. In Iowa, the Trump administration has fined the operators of a beef slaughterhouse plant just $957 after they failed to protect workers from contracting coronavirus on the job. 338 of the plant's 850 workers got sick during a major outbreak at the Iowa Premium Beef Plant in April. This week, the Occupational Health and Safety Administration ordered a $1,914 fine against the company for record-keeping violations, then agreed to cut that fine in half after negotiations with executives. The Associated Press reports four other meat plants in Iowa with major outbreaks received no fines at all, despite hundreds of COVID cases and nine deaths at the plants. At the United Nations General Assembly, Secretary General Antonio Guterres warned Thursday the coronavirus pandemic has killed nearly a million people, infected 30 million, and remains out of control due to a lack of preparedness, cooperation, unity and solidarity among world governments. This pandemic is a wake-up call for even more catastrophic challenges that may arise, starting with the climate crisis. If we meet these with the same disunity and disarray we have seen this year, I fear the worst. 
Youth climate activists are once again taking to the streets around the world to join the Fridays for Future strike for the first time since the coronavirus pandemic began. Student-led actions are taking place in South Korea, the Philippines, Germany, Sweden, and in over 3,000 places around the globe. Swedish youth climate activist Greta Thunberg tweeted, We will be back next week, next month, and next year for as long as it takes, she said. In the Arctic Circle, 18-year-old climate activist Maya Rose Craig held a protest this week standing on an iceberg surrounded by open ocean as Arctic sea ice shrank to its second lowest minimum extent on record. I am up here with Greenpeace in the Arctic, and I'm here to bear witness to the sea ice minimum, but I'm also here doing the most northerly youth strike for climate to try and make a statement about how temporary this amazing landscape is and how our leaders have to make a decision now in order to save it. Back in the United States, the Labor Department reports one and a half million U.S. workers filed new unemployment claims over the past week. That includes 870,000 applicants for regular state unemployment benefits, another 630,000 who applied for pandemic unemployment assistance. Some 26 million workers are now collecting jobless benefits. The Census Bureau reports 23 million U.S. adults live in households that do not have enough food to eat. And an estimated one in four renters with children's lives in a home lives in a home that's behind on rent. This comes as lawmakers are poised to leave Washington for an extended recess amidst the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Majority Senate Republicans have yet to pass a new coronavirus relief bill more than four months after the House passed its three trillion dollar Heroes Act. Donald Trump visited the Supreme Court Thursday, where the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg lie in repose following her death last week at the age of 87. Trump wore a mask as he and First Lady Melania Trump posed next to Ginsburg's casket on the steps of the court, one of the few times Trump has worn a mask publicly since the start of the pandemic. Members of the public who spotted Trump on the steps of the high court erupted in a chorus of boos and chants of vote him out. As, as the protests grew louder, Trump walked back inside the Supreme Court the protesters then switched their chant to honor her wish. Ginsburg's final statement, dictated to her granddaughter days before her death, read, quote, My most fervent wish is that I will not be replaced until a new president is installed, she reportedly said. Trump has said he'll name his new nominee to replace Justice Ginsburg on Saturday. Republican senators have pledged to rush confirmation proceedings for Trump's pick ahead of Election Day. Today, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's body will lie in state at the U.S. Capitol, becoming the first woman and the first Jewish person to receive the honor. In immigration news, BuzzFeed reports the House Oversight Committee has found prisoners who've died in the custody of Immigration and Customs Enforcement experience medical neglect and says ICE prison staff falsified records to cover up problems inside the jails. The report published Thursday details deaths of immigrant prisoners that could have been preventable, including failing to transfer people to the ER or placing prisoners who are sick in solitary confinement with scarce monitoring. This comes as a separate congressional report issued earlier this week found prisoners in the custody of ICE systematically receive inadequate medical, dental and mental health care and face solitary confinement as a punishment for speaking out. Mexican authorities are preparing to issue arrest warrants that could target Army soldiers for the first time in the ongoing investigation into the 2014 disappearance and presumed massacre of 43 students from a teacher's college in Ayotzinapa, Guerrero. Reuters reports new warrants are also being issued for local, state and federal police. This week, President Andres Manuel López Obrador said he'll confirm new information on the case over the weekend on the sixth anniversary of the students' abduction. And in Brazil, 
Volkswagen has agreed to pay $6.4 million to former employees who were arrested and tortured after the car company reported them as subversives during Brazil's military dictatorship of the 60s, 70s and 80s. In a settlement with Brazilian prosecutors, Volkswagen admitted it targeted union activists at its massive auto plant near Sao Paulo, where bosses spied on workers and reported outlawed newspapers and flyers to police. This is former VW employee Espedito Batista. Volkswagen chased after the workers. They incarcerated us inside the factory. Workers were handed over to the Department of Political and Social Order, which was the political authority at the time. Volkswagen's conduct at the time was willful. This settlement does not completely satisfy us. We deserve more, given our rights. But this is better than nothing. The settlement will compensate victims who were arrested, beaten, fired from their jobs and then blacklisted, left unable to find employment for years. Brazil's far-right president, former Army captain Jair Bolsonaro, has praised Brazil's military dictatorship and has called for the restoration of many of its policies. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. When we come back, we look at President Trump's statement saying he refuses to commit to accepting the results of the upcoming election if his rival, Joe Biden, wins. Stay with us. I was dreaming in my dreaming Well, of an aspect bright and fair And my sleeping, it was broken But my dream of a virtual gathering by Patti Smith with Michael Stipe, Joan Baez, Angelique Cajot, and many more as part of the Climate Week NYC 2020 and Pathway to Paris' sixth anniversary. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. For the second day in a row, President Trump refused to commit to accepting the results of the upcoming election if his rival Joe Biden wins. Trump was asked about the election as he left the White House to campaign in North Carolina. Mr. President, are the election results only legitimate if you win? So uh, we have to be very careful with the ballots. The ballots, that's a whole big scam. We want to make sure the election is honest, and I'm not sure that it can be. I don't, I don't know that it can be with this whole situation, unsolicited ballots. There are unsolicited millions being sent to everybody, and we'll see. President Trump made a similar comment Wednesday when questioned at a White House press briefing. Will you commit here today for a peaceful transferal of power after the election? Well, we're going to have to see what happens. You know that I've been complaining very strongly about the ballots, and the ballots are a disaster. I and, understand that, but and, people are rioting. Do you oh, commit to making no, sure that there's a no, peaceful wanna, transferal of power? We want to have get rid of the ballots, and you'll have a very trans. We'll have a very peaceful. There won't be a transfer, frankly. There'll be a continuation. Uh, the ballots are out of control. You know it, and you know who knows it better okay. than anybody else. The Democrats know it better than anybody else. Trump's remarks have been criticized by both Democrats and Republicans. On Thursday, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell tweeted, there will be an orderly transition just as there has been every four years since 1792, unquote. 
But at the same time, McConnell is vowing to rapidly confirm Trump's soon-to-be-announced nominee to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court. Earlier this week, Trump admitted he wants the Senate to rapidly confirm his nominee because the election could end up before the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, The Atlantic magazine has revealed Republican Party officials are looking at multiple ways to subvert the election process to ensure Trump stays in power. One option would be to have Republican-led state legislatures claim the results of the election to be fraudulent, then choose a slate of Republican electors to vote in the Electoral College, regardless of the outcome of the actual vote. We're joined right now by Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Barton Gilman, staff writer at The Atlantic. His new piece is headlined, The Election That Could Break America. Barton Gelman is author of several books, including Dark Mirror, Edward Snowden, and The American Surveillance State. Barton, thanks so much for joining us on Democracy Now! Can you lay out in detail—no sound bites, please—exactly what you found are the plans not only being talked about, but are actually being laid out all over the country? And also, what, then, surprised you most? The president is running a campaign that is premised on the idea uh, that he may not win uh, or will not win if all the votes are counted, and he's looking for insurance policies. Uh, that, that begins with uh, traditional Republican efforts to suppress the vote on Election Day uh, and extends to this long campaign he's been running against mail-in ballots uh, as a way of delegitimating them and uh, laying the groundwork for a post-election uh, or mid-count challenge that would be intended to stop the count, to uh, lock in whatever results there are on election night, uh, when, because of the way he has uh, divided the uh, vote along partisan lines, there will be more Republicans, uh, he forecasts, voting in person on Election Day, and more Democrats voting by mail uh, with counts that will continue on past election night. Uh, and so uh, delegitimating the, uh, the mail-in vote is a way of stopping the overtime count that everyone is expecting now. Uh, because we're not going to have an election night, we're going to have an election week, perhaps, or, or longer, during which the provisional ballots and the mail-in ballots, the absentee ballots, will be counted. Now, among the things uh, that uh, some Trump people are talking about is a maneuver that would start by saying that the— uh, the, the count has been poisoned by fraud, uh, has been rigged, uh, is hopelessly mired in, in, in uh, unacceptable conduct, <clears throat> and therefore that the count can't be relied upon. And we are all accustomed to the idea that electoral votes are distributed based on the way the, the popular vote goes in a given state. Uh, if somebody gets the most votes in my state, then that candidate gets that state's electoral votes. The Constitution does not actually guarantee that result. Um, that's a decision that's made by each state, because the power to appoint electors is given in the Constitution to state legislatures. Uh, the, the idea circulating in the Trump campaign and among some of its allies is that under some circumstances, they could ask state legislatures to take back that power and simply appoint Trump electors, uh, regardless of the vote count in the state. Explain uh, what loyal electors are, Barton. Well, electors are pledged uh, to one candidate or the other. Uh, which electors are appointed depends usually on the outcome of the election. When I say usually, I mean for the past 150, 175 years. <clears throat> but uh, in, in theory, uh, and depending on state law and all kinds of other complexities, uh, the Republican legislature of a state like Pennsylvania uh, 
could choose to simply appoint electors who are pledged already to Trump uh, based on their assessment that the uh, that the vote count in that state uh, is fraudulent or uh, marred by fraud, and therefore that they are going to protect the will of the people by by appointing Trump electors. Uh, in the 2000 recount between uh, Bush and Gore, uh, the Republicans actually started down this road. Uh, the the recount was still under litigation, uh, and the uh, the date for the Electoral College vote was approaching uh, in December, when the uh, Republican House in Florida. Uh, passed a resolution to appoint electors in, in in Bush's name, and the Senate was going to vote on the same day that Gore conceded the election. And since I mentioned concession, uh, it's the premise of my article, and I try to explain why, that uh, Trump's strategy is never to concede, that he may win, he may lose. But under no circumstances will he concede this election. That's a big problem because we don't actually have a mechanism for forcing a candidate to concede. Uh, and concession is the way we have ended elections. There's no grand umpire who has jurisdiction over the whole election who can blow a whistle and say, the election is over, you won, you lost. Uh, and make that stick. Uh, we have relied instead on the loser to accept reality uh, when the time comes. So you mention in your article that this will be the first election in 40 years to take place without a federal judge requiring the Republican National Committee to seek approval in advance for any ballot security operations at the polls. Why is this oversight so crucial, Barton? Well, let me just give a, a, a backstory that helps explain that. Uh, in the 1981 gubernatorial election in New Jersey, the uh, Republican National Committee organized what it called a, a ballot security task force. That was the euphemism. And uh, it composed of uh, a lot of off-duty uh, law enforcement officers, sheriffs, and so forth, wearing guns, talking into radios wearing uh, ballot security armbands, who uh, went to polling places in uh, neighborhoods, predominantly people of color, uh, and in, in Trenton and Newark, uh, and just bluntly to suppress the vote. They, they challenged people's credentials. They, uh, they, they gave stern warnings against, uh, pe about penalties for unlawful voting. Uh, they, generally speaking, intimidated uh, the voters and some poll workers, uh, barging into uh, closed areas, giving instructions to poll workers, in some cases physically pre preventing poll workers from assisting voters who needed help uh, physically filling out their ballots, uh, which is a normal function. Uh, and the Democratic National Committee sued and uh, after introducing evidence, quickly won a consent decree in which the judge forbade a whole long list of intimidation techniques uh, and required that the RNC would submit any plans it had for Election Day operations to the judge for prior approval. And that lasted almost 40 years. Uh, the uh, RNC persuaded the judge— uh, in 2018, uh, to lift this consent decree, to lift the preclearance order, uh, because there had been no recent violations by the RNC of the consent decree. Uh, so it was the logic was uh, that this consent decree is no longer needed because it worked. So uh, the RNC is now free to choose its own forms of Election Day operations, its own ballot security, uh, and we'll have to see what happens. But uh, the Trump campaign and the Republicans are recruiting uh, what they're calling an army for Trump 
of uh, 15,000 or so volunteers who will monitor uh, security of the polls. Uh, and that means going into Democratic areas and looking for suspicious people. Now, Donald Trump has taken Donald Trump Jr. has taken to social media to call, quote, able bodied people to join an election security army for his father. Are yeah, laying that... the groundwork to steal this election from my father, President Donald Trump. They are planting stories that President Trump will have a landslide lead on election night, but will lose when they finish counting the mail in ballots. Their plan is to add millions of fraudulent ballots that can cancel your vote and overturn the election. We cannot let that happen. We need every able bodied man, woman to join Army for Trump's election security operation. Every able-bodied man and woman. And then Trump calls into Fox News to Sean Hannity, um, saying we're going to have sheriffs and we're going to have law enforcement and we're going to have, hopefully, U.S. attorneys to keep close watch on these polls in states more likely to vote Democrat or contested stakes like Florida and Texas. When you say you're going to have sheriffs there, uh, you're going to have attorneys there, people are going to be afraid. Well, you are uh, forecasting a physical confrontation, talking about uh, talking about law enforcement officers, talking about able-bodied people. What, why do they need to be able-bodied? What, what, are, what are they facing here? Uh, what kind of atmosphere are they trying to create? So when you started this piece um, to now, when you published it, did you change your attitude? I mean, when people were saying, oh, if President Trump were to lose, he'll never leave the White House, others weren't that deeply concerned, you know, whether he could be taken out of the White House. But this is a whole different story when you have an army of something like a thousand Republican lawyers around the country who are going to challenge votes at every level, particularly focusing on mail-in votes. Yet, at the same time, Trump is not quite sure um, if uh, he's being too discouraging of mail-in voting for Republican voters. So, at the same time, he's telling Republican voters, you can mail in your votes. He is. Uh, Republican organizers uh, were distressed, uh, and some of them still are very much distressed, by the campaign against mail-in ballots, because they have relied for years on mail-in ballots to lock in votes before Election Day. If you're trying to get out your own vote, uh, it's a big advantage if, in the days and weeks leading up to the election, you can uh, induce people to send in their ballots, uh, wow. tell you they've done so, and therefore you're very confident you, you've already gotten out let's say, 25 percent of your vote. You can focus all your efforts on Election Day, on the rest. Uh, and and uh, there are many senior voters who have relied on mail-in balloting for years. Uh, you don't want to tell your own voters, if you're a Republican, uh, that this method is now uh, forbidden. So uh, there's been a bit of a mixed message where uh, they've prevailed upon Trump to say, well, these mail-in ballots are good, now, the other kind are bad. Uh, he's leaving himself lots of room to challenge uh, the ballots as fraudulent. Uh, and and the way uh, the way his son described it in the clip he played is that uh, Trump will be winning on election night, uh, and then uh, sort of thousands and millions of fraudulent votes will be added. Uh, fraudulently to the results uh, in order to steal the election from his father. Uh, he's referring to uh, a, a phenomenon that's beginning to become fairly well known, known as the blue shift, in which you have uh, one vote count, uh, let's say, on the morning after the election uh, that is provisional, that, that is up, up to that point. And then you have an overtime count, which is uh, counting all the latest reporting uh, precincts, the provisional ballots, uh, which come from people who need to prove 
uh, that they're eligible to vote. Perhaps they've recently changed address uh, uh, or there was a name discrepancy that needs to be resolved. And then there's all the mail-in ballots. And they're slower to count uh, because they're uh, they're more elaborate. They are uh, they're sealed in outer envelopes. Uh, the the election authorities have to uh, review the envelope, check the signature, scan a barcode, uh, authenticate other details so that they know it's a, a valid ballot before they even open it. Then they have to physically open up the ballot, remove an inner security envelope, uh, which is sealed, uh, you know, discard the outer shell, put the security envelope in a pile to be opened again. Uh, so that the ballots can be scanned. Um, that's just a whole process that doesn't exist for uh, in-person ballots. And most states forbid election authorities to start doing this review and opening the outer envelope until Election Day itself. And so there's no way that they can handle the anticipated volume of mail-in ballots now. And uh, so those are going to come in overtime in, in the days following the election. For some reason, that's not fully explained. Uh, these overtime counts have trended Democratic in recent years, since about the past 20 years. And so it is known and predictable that the overtime count is going to uh, shift blue. Uh, and that's why uh, Trump is trying to delegitimate uh, the idea of mail-in ballots at all. And by doing so, he is actually skewing the blue shift even more. He is guaranteeing uh, that his own voters will avoid mail-in ballots because they believe him. Uh, and let's just emphasize that what he's saying about mail ballots is fabricated. It's made up out of whole cloth. Uh, mail ballots have been used successfully and with vanishingly rare attempts at fraud. Uh, for decades. Uh, so uh, he's just making that up. Uh, and especially is, Democrats voting more mail-in at this point during the pandemic because they see COVID as real and more Republicans see it as a conspiracy. That's right. Uh, that's right. Uh, but the advantage for Trump of uh, dividing the electorate in this particular way is that he can challenge mail votes uh, without worrying very much that he is uh, that that he is uh, invalidating his own voters' ballots, uh, that just sort of by the by the odds, if you manage to uh, squelch a mail-in ballot, at every single one that you manage to uh, invalidate is much more likely to be a Democratic vote than a Republican vote. We just have a minute to go. But what are Democrats and Republicans who are deeply alarmed about this and independents and Greens doing to counter this? Well, they're, they're, trying, to, uh, they're trying to win the battle for public opinion about the validity of mail-in ballots. <clears throat> and uh, it's not clear how well that works. The, the president is— extremely good at creating impressions of chaos. Uh, they are uh, fighting a 41-state legal battle uh, that's been going on all year uh, to ensure that mail-in ballots are uh, counted, to try to get them counted early, uh, to uh, there's this sort of uh, beneath-the-surface struggle over the rules. Uh, to make sure that every ballot is counted. Uh, and they are trying to imagine what Trump will do uh, that is out of the norm on Election Day and afterward during this interregnum between Election Day and Inauguration Day. Uh, and that's the crucial 79-day period that I focus on in my piece for The Atlantic. Well, Martin Gelman, we thank you so much for being with us, staff writer at The Atlantic. We're going to link to your piece there um, called The Election That Could Break America. And congratulations on your new book, Dark Mirror, Edward Snowden and the American Surveillance State. This is Democracy Now! As we end this segment, let's hear from President Trump speaking to delegates at the Republican National Convention last month. The only way they can take this election away from us 
is if this is a rigged election, we're going to win this election. Right. Right. Win this election. Yeah. What they're doing is using COVID yeah. to right. steal an election. Right. Right. They're right. using exactly. COVID to defraud the American people, all of our people, of a fair and free election. Here, here. We can't do that. On Thursday afternoon, independent Senator Bernie Sanders um, spoke out, uh, responding to Trump's remarks. I think it is terribly important that we actually listen to and take seriously what Donald Trump is saying. Several weeks ago, speaking at the Republican National Convention, Trump said, and I quote, the only way they can take this election away from us is if this is a rigged election, end of quote. What is remarkable about that statement is that he made it at a time when almost every national poll had him behind and when he was trailing in polls in most battleground states. Think about what that statement means. Think hard about what that statement means. What he is saying is that if he wins the election, that's great. But if he loses, it's rigged. Because the only way, the only way he can lose is if it's rigged. And if it's rigged, then he is not leaving office. Heads I win, tails you lose. In other words, in Trump's mind, there is no conceivable way that he should leave office. And this is how independent Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont ended his address. In this unprecedented moment, what can we as a people do in the struggle to preserve American democracy? First, it is absolutely imperative that we have, by far, the largest voter turnout in American history and that people vote as early as possible. As someone who is strongly supporting Joe Biden, let's be clear. A landslide victory for Biden will make it virtually impossible for Trump to deny the results and is our best means for defending democracy. Second, with the pandemic and a massive increase in mail-in voting, state legislatures must take immediate action now, now, to allow mail-in votes to be counted before Election Day, as they come in. In fact, 32 states allow for the counting or processing of absentee ballots, verifying signatures, for example, before Election Day. All states should do the same. The faster all ballots are counted, the less window there is for chaos and conspiracy theories. Third, the news media needs to prepare the American people to understand there is no longer a single election day and that it is very possible that we may not know the results on November 3rd. Fourth, social media companies must finally get their act together and stop people from using their tools to spread disinformation and to threaten and harass election officials. Fifth, in the Congress and in state legislatures, hearings must be held as soon as possible to explain to the public how the election day process and the days that follow will be handled. As we count every vote, and prevent voter intimidation. Everything possible must be done to prevent chaos, disinformation, and yes, even violence. Lastly, and most importantly, the American people, no matter what their political view, must make it clear that American democracy will not be destroyed. Senator Bernie Sanders speaking in Washington, D.C. Thursday in his first major public speech since bowing out of the presidential race. Coming up, we'll speak to one of the most powerful religious leaders in the country, Bishop Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, the first African-American to lead the denomination. Stay with us. Don't know how it ends Comes a time when you 
Stay by Sharon Van Etten. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The U.S. coronavirus death toll officially passed 200,000 this week. On Sunday, the Washington National Cathedral of the Episcopal Church marked the sobering milestone by tolling its bell 200 times, once for every thousand lives lost. Well, to discuss those lives lost and the extraordinary circumstances the nation faces today, we spend the rest of the hour with Bishop Michael Curry, presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, the first African-American to lead the denomination. Bishop Curry is the descendant of enslaved Africans, the son of the late civil rights activist Reverend Kenneth Curry. Bishop Curry gained worldwide recognition when he delivered a sermon at the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle in 2018, where he preached about slavery, poverty, and the enduring power of love. On that day, he later said in an interview he could, quote, feel slaves around the place, and it was like their voice was somehow heard that day. Bishop Michael Curry was previously the bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of North Carolina, a swing state that President Trump visited just yesterday for the fifth time this month to campaign. Bishop Michael Curry joins us now from Raleigh in this key battleground state of North Carolina. We thank you so much for joining us, uh, Bishop Curry. Your new book is Love is the Way, Holding on to Hope in Troubling Times. Bishop Curry, welcome to Democracy Now! Do you think love is enough? Well, without love, we won't make it. With love, we will. But love by itself, obviously, is not enough. But we need love because love not only—and uh, again, I'm not talking about love as a sentiment. I'm talking about love as a personal and moral commitment um, to a particular way of living, a way of living that is unselfish even sacrificial, a way of living that seeks the good and the welfare and the well-being of others as well as the self. That's the kind of love that you see in the New Testament teachings of Jesus of Nazareth that he learned from the Hebrew scriptures from Moses. Um, that's the kind of love, if you will, that you see when Jesus encountered a lawyer and they talked about, the lawyer came and said, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, Jesus said, what, is it, what did Moses say in the law? Love God and love your neighbor. Jesus said, that's it. Do that and you will live. You will find life. The lawyer came back. He was a lawyer. So he comes back and he said, but could we more narrowly define who is my neighbor? And that was the point at which Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, of someone who helped someone else who was of a different ethnic group, probably a different set of politics, someone who was of a different religious take on their religious community, um, someone who was different, someone who was the other. And this man helped that other person simply because they were a brother, a fellow child of God, made in God's image and likeness. And Jesus says, who was neighbor to that man? And the, the guy says, well, the one who helped him out. And Jesus says, go and do thou likewise. The love that I'm talking about is a love that is for the other as well as the self, that is for God and for all of us. It is a love that seeks to create and make a better world, a more humane world, a more just world. Without that commitment to love, then all the practical details won't work. But with that commitment, we can find a way to solve our problems together, to bring everybody together, bipartisan, across the aisle, ecumenical, interfaith, all races, all stripes and types, because we share one moral commitment to seek the good of others as well as ourselves. Bishop Curry, what about President Trump refusing to say, uh, refusing to commit to a peaceful transition of power? Well, let me just say this. I am an American. I love America, and I believe in America's democracy. And in this democracy, there is a peaceful transition of power. That is one of the cornerstones, um, one of the great heritages, heritage of this country. Um, and so we must all stand for that. I, I don't, you have to ask President Trump what he was talking about. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. I'm talking about American democracy. And American democracy 
And this doesn't have to do with what red or blue. This is not about Republican, Democrat, or independent. This is about we actually... Can I tell you something? One of the things I've learned over the years is that we actually share more values than we disagree about. And if we can claim those values, one of which is the ba are the basic principles of being a democratic republic, of democracy, um, some of those values are enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men, all people are created equal. That's a value of this country. The Gettysburg Address, that's a val contains values um, of this country. Um, you can go through the pantheon of this country above um, the, the columns of the Supreme Court, equal justice under the law. If we will stand together for the values that we share, we will find enough common ground to debate and decide and to solve our problems. And I, that's democracy. And I, that's America. I want to ask you about what happened in May during the national uprising against police brutality. National Guard and police officers dressed in riot gear fired tear gas, rubber bullets, flashbangs to disperse peaceful protesters across from the White House in Lafayette Square. Moments later, President Donald Trump walked through the cleared park to have his photo taken with a Bible in front of your church, St. John's Episcopal Church, often called the Church of the Presidents, which was boarded up. When he returned to the White House, Trump refused to take questions from reporters as he pumped his fist and posed for another photo op. This is what he said. Was this your idea that the protesters that were tear gassed so you could make that trip, Mr. President? Mr. President, what are you doing about excessive Mr. police President, use of force? Mr. President, is this still a democracy? Bishop Marianne Edgar Buddy, head of the Episcopal Diocese of, um, of Washington, D.C., immediately denounced Trump's actions. This is what she said on the PBS NewsHour, explaining why she spoke out. It was a... It was a confluence of events in the in the very short period of time when the images of the president um, following the, the the dispersal of the crowds that you mentioned, um, following his extremely inflammatory, um, to my ears, uh, remarks in the Rose Garden, and then and then bringing himself and his entourage into our sacred space, using it as a backdrop and holding the Bible as if to put on the mantle of religious authority or um, blessing of what he had, had just said and done. And I felt it was urgent to remove that association as quickly as possible and to state our position in faithfulness to the gospel as we understand it. That's Episcopal Bishop Marian Edgar, buddy. You're the um, presiding bishop of the entire Episcopal Church. Your thoughts mm -hmm. on the use of your church in this way? Well, let me, let me say it this way, and I, I said it at the time. Um, it doesn't matter to me whether it is a Democrat or Republican in the White House. It doesn't matter to me uh, which side of the aisle someone is on. The church must not be used for partisan political purposes. The faith, uh, the Christian faith, is not up for sale by to anybody, um, left or right, Democrat or Republican. Um, and so the, the, the uh, use of the church building— um, without anybody, we didn't know about it. The Bishop of Washington didn't know about it. The pastor of the parish didn't know about it. That is, that is just simply wrong. And the use of the Holy Scriptures for partisan purposes by anybody, um, by any partisan purposes by anybody, um, that is wrong. And it is wrong to remove uh, peaceful protesters. I say all of that. If the president had gone across and ask the pastor of the church, can I go in and say a prayer for the country? We, we've got some problems. Or if he had gone across and just simply said to the cameras, Listen, I know you all, there are people who disagree with me and there are people who agree with me, but we're all Americans and we need to pray for our country. I couldn't object to that. That, that That's fine. That's spiritual, moral leadership. Um, but to use the church, the faith, or Christianity, or anybody's religion, as far as I'm concerned, for partisan political purposes um, is, is inappropriate and wrong. Now, having said all of that, though, we've got to move beyond that. We have got to find a way in this country um, to work together, to exercise our vote, to go out and vote, and vote your values. Um, I believe that. Vote your values. Somebody said, do you mean, what about people who don't share your values? That's their right in this democratic society. 
Everybody must go out and vote. Vote for your, your values on propositions, uh, for the candidates of your choice. But here's what we must do more importantly. And this gets back to the importance of the love that I'm talking about. We must find ways to come together um, and, and actually acknowledge and get to know each other as people. And don't think that that's mere sentiment. Um, uh, uh, Bill Bishop in that book, The Big Sort, talks about how America has basically resegregated itself. Um, people listen to news media that give them reinforcement of the views they already hold. People who watch MSNBC do not watch Fox News, in all likelihood, and vice versa. Um, my point is, we have actually people who uh, live in various zip codes. We know there are blue zip codes and there are red zip codes, and there are a couple of purple ones and different ones. But people live together with people they already agree with. We must find a way to come together as people with differences First, on common ground, that we're all children of God, Bishop, no matter who we are. Bishop and Curry, then, yeah. I, I, I want to get in a few other questions. And one of them, Scientific American, which hadn't done this in its entire 150-year history, endorsed a presidential candidate. Um, what can we expect from religious leaders? Religious leaders are moral leaders, and we must articulate the moral values that we stand and believe in. Um, we believe first in the moral value uh, and the primacy of unselfish, sacrificial love. We believe that all men, all people are created equal. Uh, Genesis 1 says that. Uh, we are created in the image of God equally. And that means, for me, if we are equal in the eyes of God, we must all be equal in the eyes of the law, and we must all be treated equally equally as children of God. That means that there are moral, that moral principle but governs Bishop, a lot. will religious leaders be taking a stand together? Now that, I mean, you know how many religious leaders there are? <laughs> There, there are, there are. I'm sure there are. There's a diversity of opinion among religious leaders on how to live out those values. Um, but I think those values are clear. There are some who wouldn't agree with me. Well, I can't change their mind. Um, but I stand on the values of love, equality, human dignity. Um, that means that I don't support policies that separate children from their parents at the border of this country. I don't support policies that do not respect the rights and grant equality to all people in this country, regardless of their race, uh, class, religion, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, that, that we are all equal. That is a value that I be believe must be in public policy. Bishop so Curry, I wanted to ask you about the amazing sermon you gave at the royal wedding between um, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, in which you preached about slavery, poverty, the enduring power of love. Earlier this year, mm -hmm. the couple resigned from the royal family, essentially. Afua Hirsch wrote a piece in The New York Times titled, Black Britons Know Why Meghan Markle Wants Out, It's the Racism. She writes from the first headline about her being almost straight out of Compton and having Having exotic DNA, the racist treatment of Meghan has been impossible to ignore. Princess Michael of Kent wore an overtly racist brooch in the Duchess's company. A BBC host compared the couple's newborn baby to a chimpanzee. Do you think that they were forced out of the church, that they took this stand, or whether they were forced out of the royal family, that they took this stand to protest racism? You know, the answer is, I don't know. Let me tell you what I do know. What I do know is that we in this country, because I don't know all the details of Britain, but I know the United States of America, and I know that we have some issues of racism that we must address that are deeply entrenched in our history, and we have to face those issues and that past. The reality of what's going on right now with um, the Breonna Taylor situation, this woman who was innocent and she was gunned down, um, or George Floyd, and it goes back to Emmett Till, we've got some issues that are longstanding, that have deep roots in racism in this country. And we must face those questions now and work together to find the reforms and the changes that will be necessary to right wrongs, um, and then also to create the kind of community among us where there is room and space for all of us, black, white, Brown, we have to leave Asian, it there. Bishop Curry, thank you so much for being with us. The first African-American bishop of the Episcopal Church. I'm Amy Goodman.